welcome uh, uh, to WCC tonight. I appreciate everybody coming out and, and joining us for, for a, uh, a brief uh, presentation by Title Source. Thank you for coming out, uh, Azam, and, and your colleagues from Title Source. I appreciate the connection to uh, all of uh, Dan Gilbert's uh, uh, satellites in, in Detroit. It's been a good relationship for us. We've had a number of students that have gone to Quicken Loans and Title Source, and, and uh, they've had a wonderful experience, and, and you've been great as an advisor to our program since you graduated from WCC. Uh, Azam warned me not, not to spend too much time on his background. I will, I will just add that uh, Azam was, uh, I, I think, one of the, the, the greatest success stories we've had out of WCC. Uh, he, but he's a very motivated, self-motivated person. When he was taking classes here, he was working on uh, coding and, and additional languages outside of the classroom. Very self-motivated and would have been a success anywhere, if truth be told. He's that kind of an individual. Uh, nevertheless, um, I appreciate you keeping the doors open to Title Source with us and agreeing to come down and talk to us about what's new in the world of software development at Title Source. And um, one uh, quick announcement before I officially turn it over to you. Go ahead. So I passed it along um, a career services brochure as well as my card. Hopefully if there's uh, some opportunities or things that you might want to be interested in pursuing with Title Source or any other IT uh, company, um, you know, obviously the first step is getting your resume done and some of the essentials, cover letter and interviewing. So um, feel free to give me a call if you don't have your resume in, in good order. Uh, we certainly do that at Career Services. We want to get you prepared for an interview, and, and hopefully you'll find that there's lots of great opportunities at Title Source, and, and maybe this will spark your, your chance to get going with uh, applying for a position there. So thank that, and I'll turn it back over to you. Okay. Well, I'm excited to come here on behalf of Title Source to talk to you guys about IT in Title Source and the industry, not just in Title Source, to see what's going on in the industry. So, I'll introduce myself. I'm Azam Aziz. A lot of you know me, and not a lot of you. I am a WCC alumni. I uh, took my first computer science class in here, and I fell in love with it with the best professor, Khal Mansour. Thank you. Um, it, was, it was the best class I've taken, and I continued on to take more classes with WCC. So, eventually, I became a lab aide and started helping out students started helping out the professors with any questions, bugs they have, anything like that. Uh, that's how I, how I started with my career. Then, you can go back. Yep. After that, there was a great program, Experience IT Detroit. Mr. Neil Goodson told me about this opportunity. It's a training program that happens between the Detroit companies as a whole. We all get together, we train 50 students for full-time for a couple of weeks, about 8, 12 weeks, and there's a hiring rate of 80%. I went to that program. I didn't know what's going on in there. It's the first time doing it. Turned out great. Tyler Source took an interest in me at that time and said, okay, well, we'll give you an internship. We'll see where that goes. I was an intern at Tyler Source for the shortest internship I ever heard of in Tyler Source. It was one month. I worked at uh, an application called Rubik's. It was a um, document data mining service that uses OCR technologies, and we'll talk about that as we go in the presentation. After that, I was a uh, software engineer, and I've been a software engineer with them for the past three years now. It's coming up to three years, actually, soon. And here I am, talking to you guys about all of this. So, the things that we're going to be talking about today, the agenda, so you guys are clear on what's going on. The first thing is, What's in it for me? So what's in it for me? You guys are coming here to see the presentation. You can move on to the next one. Yeah, wink. <laughs> I'll wink. What's in it for me? You guys are coming here. It's not just for the pizza, although maybe some. But to talk about what's going on in the industry and in Tyler Shaw specifically, and these three points that I have in here. First one being developer expectations. What do companies expect of developers? What are they looking for as far as soft skills, as far as technical skills? What are we looking for? The next thing is tire source technologies. 
with a lot of technologies out there, how do we use these technologies for the business? How do we bring a business value out of it? If there's no business value in a technology, it becomes a toy. And I love toys, but you have to get some business value out of it. Um, we, how do we use it with our projects? One of our projects that I'm using, Rubik's. How am I using these technologies with Rubik's or any other projects? And the last thing is, we'll talk about the future of computer science. Where is it heading next? You guys hear about the Google driving car. How is it doing that? Machine learning and artificial intelligence. We'll talk a little bit about that. So up next is Glenn Stempek. He'll talk to you guys about TerraSource technologies and technologies in the industry. My name is Glenn Stempek. For those that don't know me, which is everybody. Um, <laughs> And, and I'm here, like, I'm really into the, the what's in it for me with technology. Um, and, and, like, I care about making a difference. Like, I don't want to just go write code that nobody uses. So I want to kind of convey to you today uh, a little bit about what we do at Tidal Source that, that makes an impact on lives and, and what kind of things we're working on, what kind of technologies we're using. Um, so first, the boring stuff. I actually have a lot of clicking. I Literally, every bullet point you're going to have to click through. So... Uh, just keep clicking and I'll try to keep up with you. So, <laughs> uh, personally, uh, I got my uh, computer science degree in 2003, um, which, I mean, it's only 13 years ago, but it's like 130 in computer years, so I'm a little behind, uh, but I've been keeping up by, by keeping up with uh, folks like you. Uh, I started out uh, as a server guy, small business, just after the dot-com bubble burst. Uh, so I was helping them out, setting up servers and email servers, and uh, eventually got into small applications and websites. And um, we, luckily, we, company I was at, was, as long as we were making money, they were happy. So whether it was installing servers or building software that we could resell, I got a lot of opportunities there. Um, Moved on to uh, building inventory systems that we resold and accounting integrations. And uh, put up here, I was a software engineer at that point. And the reason I put that up there is because uh, you'll see when Jordan speaks, there's a difference between the, what we might call a code monkey or developer or programmer hacking together some applications and an engineer that is focused on like the craftsmanship of building thing with, things the right way building that bridge that people can actually drive over reliably for 100 years. So there comes a point where you've built applications, you've learned from them, and you've learned new principles and how to apply them, and you get to the point where you're an engineer. You're actually crafting things rather than throwing things, solutions together. Um, moved into title source uh, seven years ago. So the collective, what we call our family of companies, uh, uh, including Quicken Loans and Title Source, had maybe 200 technology team members, including all of us, Quicken Loans, Title Source, Fathead, and all of them uh, around the time I started. Um, and we focused solely on internal business applications and client facing sites so that we could drive business and spread across the entire country and get more and more people. Um, what we call engineered to amaze technologies for the, the mortgage and a lot of the back end services we do at Title Source. Um, and eventually mobile apps, once those became cool in 2009 or 10. Um, moving in, into enterprise architecture after that, uh, with focus on as the teams grew, now we've got thousands of people, and how do we make sure that we're learning from our past and, and applying the right technologies for the new solutions that we're coming up with. And uh, today I'm leading our application development team. A um, lot of the same things, combining the right technology with the right people, with the right projects at the right time, and, and constantly focused on that difference. What is the diff that we can make in the world and the customer experience we're providing? Because you got to start with that before you work backwards toward the tech, towards the tech, technology. Um, best advice I ever rece uh, received, I had a, a class in, in college that was one day was dedicated to this professor brainwashing us and he, he said here's all the reasons that you should be a jack of all trades in technology and um, a lot of it was centered around um, you can specialize but COBOL went away you can specialize but someday C sharp dot net Java those are gonna go away like we're constantly replacing our technologies with something that's faster 
at developing solutions. Um, so it's really important to, to learn patterns and best practices and, and the, the server things and like get into as much as you possibly can so that uh, you can jump into anything. I threw in the master of some because you've got to at least become a master in something so that you can learn it at a deep enough level to know what you need to learn in other areas. So, um, so you have the benefit in IT of career flexibility. I mean, you, can, you can jump all over the place. You can go to, across the entire world if you want to and take on contracts all over the place. So you can get into the servers, you can get into the programming, you can get into a variety of things. And, oh, yeah, I had a whole, whole bunch of really good notes that I should read to you here. Uh, so yeah, a lot of people jump from <laughs> job to job in technology because either they get bogged down with what they've implemented and Everything you develop, you have to forever support, maintain. People are going to want features for it. A lot of people get bored with that and maintaining the same thing over and over again. Um, and there's, there's other reasons, uh, like you, you get not only bogged down and not able to take on new things, um, but uh, what's the other great reason, man? I'm going to find it here. So <laughs> uh, a lot of times you're not given opportunities to change, learn new things, and adapt, and, and you get stuck. So our approach at Title Source is to make sure that we're constantly pairing people with the interest of the time and uh, giving them opportunities to learn interesting challenges like Azam took on with, with the Rubik's and OCR and, and moving people when they get weighed down with so much maintenance in support of a system that, hey, some, someone new to the company may really be excited by check, trying to maintain and add features to that, but Azam's bored of it now, so let's get him on a new project that keeps him interested so he doesn't have to do the jump from job to job unless he wants to. We're not going to give him a reason. It's going to be that uh, you know, I wanted to move to the UK because I hear they have really good, I better not make any bad jokes, I'm being filmed. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to talk about the projects for a minute. So <laughs> this guy up here, he doesn't care. He, he states it, he wears a shirt. No, no, one, no one cares. I, I got to ask first, does anyone know who this guy is? Okay. Good. I just want to make sure it wasn't like a relative and I was about to say bad things about him. Um, when you're, anyone here own a home already? Hands a few, okay. Couple, anybody like plan to own a home someday? All right, we're at half maybe, half of you can own a home someday, all right. I'm good with that, but uh, when you go to buy your first home or refinance an existing home, you, uh, may run into someone that doesn't care, but unfortunately, this is the dude that's selling you your house. <laughs> so he might not care, but we care, and that's what Title Source does. Um, we have a project called Where's the File, for example. And Where's the File, that's where the WTF came from. I figured I'd start with that one because it fit the picture well. But uh, Where's the File is all centered around click through. You just keep rolling. Uh, every client signing a mortgage can rest assured that we've done the research on the property and we know that that guy actually owns it. He's not ripping you off and selling you something that hasn't, isn't actually his. Um, we also track all of the files through at the point where you've actually signed your mortgage documents to, to close on that home. Uh, we're applying technology to classify and audit and, and make sure that it's funded and it's gonna go to the county and get recorded because if none of that happens, you don't really own it. Like you may go, the customer experience is actually far more relaxed than what happens behind the scenes. Like you, you click through and you get your mortgage and then you go and sign and it's like, woohoo, got my home. You just gotta figure out how to get into it now. Um, meanwhile, we're protecting you from that guy with, with all of the technology we have behind the scenes, uh, verifying every little aspect of that uh, mortgage you just signed. Some of those technologies include uh, Microsoft's .NET Framework. So we have a combination of Microsoft technologies and some other technologies I'll get into. But uh, we have a lot of console jobs that are 
automating algorithms, for example, to run checklists on all of that, those mortgage documents with that OCR data that, that Azam pulled out of them. And uh, OCR packages that, that are just free flowing, you apply them, include them in .NET, and you can start using them. And then we build the logic around actually what we need to look at to ensure that the, the data in those documents is legit and proper. Um, using Lucene.net, uh, for example, for search capabilities within the documents and classifying them. So like you get a whole stack of papers, 100 deep, you sign them all, but that's really made up of, say, 10 different documents. And, and we got to sort all that out and make sure that when we send it to the county, you uh, actually get those proper documents recorded. So technology enables us to uh, as, as uh, quickly as possible and accurately as possible, gather all that information, make sure it's accurate, um, and then even send it off electronically to the county for, for recording. Um, we've got WPF rich clients, for example. So I'll mean, give you an example. Like you, you might have a situation where we've got our 100 pages you signed and your 12 documents come in and the system can't recognize one. And you're going to hear a bit about machine learning uh, with Brian, but uh, in that case, what we would do is serve it up in a WPF client to, to user, uh, using, again, a, a document uh, viewer plugin that uh, makes it easy to thumb through all the pages of that document and say, all right, here's the type that it is. And then we learn from that. We feed it back in, and machine learning next time is going to tell us, hey, I know what that is, because people have been telling me in our manual interface and classifying them for us. So yeah, we, we dot every uh, I and cross every T and, and make sure that uh, you know, the folks buying homes are actually uh, buying homes from people that can sell them and you've signed all the paperwork and it's, it's at the county offices. So my next project, I only have a few projects to talk about. This one's about Walla Walla, Washington. Has anyone ever been to Walla Walla, Washington? Walla Walla. I, I chose Walla Walla because it's a cool name. I didn't even know it existed. And it's got such a low population that, well, if we happen to get an order for a house, you don't see many houses there, <laughs> purchase in Walla Walla, Washington, we're probably going to screw it up. <laughs> and you know, our goal is to cover all 50 states. And, and part of the challenge in, in what we do is those edge cases like Walla Walla, Washington. Like, um, we, we have to be smart about this. How, how do we actually ensure you get the same level of service in Walla Walla, Washington as we give in an Ann Arbor where we do so many purchases and refinances that we know how to do it. It's easy. And we've got the machine learning to back it up. Answer. Haystack. So we have a project called Haystack. So Walla Walla, Washington doesn't become a needle in the haystack that is a problem we don't even know about because we've got tens of thousands of, of purchases and refinances going on. It's a giant haystack and we don't want this needle sitting there for six months unrecognized. So we take any special property situation that may result in complications and we escalate it. We send it to a queue for users to look at and handle with the same level of uh, urgency that we would any other property but we know that this thing might have problems because we haven't done it before, so we're going to bubble it up to an escalation queue. Um, some of the technologies we use there is uh, we have a SQL server with uh, uh, our data modeling on it so that we can crunch all of the data that we have and look for like criteria surrounding this property that tells us, hey, we should escalate this thing into a queue for somebody to look at because it's got a lot of attributes that are unknown to me or I don't know how to handle. Um, and then our data models are exported to stored procedures, and we're using uh, .NET WCF services so that my queue, for example, can just call a service, and that smart model tells me, here's the guys you care about, and they pop up, and now my users can work through the escalations that we're, we're escalating because we know that there's problems foreseen with them. Right, so the machine learning decides, here's what we need to escalate, and as a result of what we end up doing on that property, the goal is the person who did some actions tells that model, 
here's what I did, and we learned from it. So now eventually, we'll learn how to do Walla Walla Washington, and it won't get escalated anymore based on the escalations that are actually occurring. We'll, we'll get better and better. And that, that again is a WPF rich client that we escalate that up to and our, our business team actually pulls it up and, uh, and works with it. So I don't have an exciting like dude in a bad t-shirt or Walla Walla Washington for this one. I looked, I couldn't find anything like appraisal related that was, I don't know, anything other than this, I guess. Um, so appraisals, uh, last project I was, I was gonna mention is uh, my appraisal connection uh, we, we built recently uh, because appraisals, like everybody goes to Zillow and you can see like estimated home values. Um, but what you don't see is that a lot of those are wrong and there's thousands of attributes that appraisers actually use to give a proper valuation for a home. So you can go ahead and click through. We had a project called uh, My Appraisal Connection where we built mobile applications for the appraisers out in the field um, to not only receive orders and opportunities for orders in areas that they served and accept them, uh, but also to support their ability to, while in the field, when they're filling out thousands of fields of information in their appraisal report, um, comparing it to neighboring comparable properties, trying to come up with that value, um, we are, are able to let them immediately submit their work, run thousands of rules uh, to validate that they didn't mess up in their appraisal report to begin with, with any obvious things. I guess obvious things that are over a thousand rules. But uh, the idea is we're, we're enabling them in the same way that Uber is enabled to provide a better experience for their folks that they're driving. We're giving appraisers all the tools that they need to provide a better experience to a homeowner who is getting, uh, you know, purchasing a home or needs a property valuation from them. We want to give them all those tools so that it's as accurate as possible. And again, we can feed that data into our system and, and maybe someday we'll have a better, more accurate Zillow result out of it. So again, we're using uh, Microsoft uh, technologies for this. We have uh, data science models. This kind of combines the first two projects. We've got the, the models that we're learning from based on the data, and we also have uh, applications running in the background with uh, web APIs, for example, Microsoft web APIs, which are easy to stand up and provide support for mobile applications. Um, and we do have, as well, iOS, and Android-based mobile applications that we're delivering to the appraisers, um, and a website uh, so that they can uh, access it from anywhere, even outside of those, those mobile devices, and upload their reports and that sort of thing. So, um, just give you some reasons behind why we use this, why we use the technologies we do. So, we're able to get things done super quick. Is, is the short and simple with, with things like C-sharp and the .NET framework. Uh, there's a huge community of experts. Um, give you an example, so like uh, anyone here ever gone to stackoverflow.com to get answers? It's like biggest Q&A site for programmers. There's well over a million answers to questions for C-sharp alone. Um, and, and it's similar for like a JavaScript or a Java. Uh, but if you take even uh, an Angular or an Android or an iOS um, or even a C++ and, and you have less than half that, you've got, I think for C++, 200,000 answers out there. I'm sure there's plenty of questions about C++. Um, I know I still have questions and I feel like I know programming pretty well at this point. Um, but uh, ultimately, you've got a lot of support to get answers from a huge community. Um, with, with something like C-sharp. And we also uh, have a lot of uh, built-in tools uh, and compiler magic. So like language features, for example, are, are beginning to be copied from languages like C-sharp, um, even in things like Swift. Like iOS uh, started with Objective-C and now they're moving towards Swift and a lot of the language features are very similar. Um, if you actually look up Swift for C-sharp and, and look through it, It'll side by side show like, wow, this is like the same thing I'm looking at here. Um, and even JavaScript starting to jump on that bandwagon and introduce uh, enumerables and, and other 
lambda type features that uh, C sharps already had and been spearheading. And a lot of those are, are help us conveniently do things uh, quickly and uh, in less code. Um, and, and going back to the, the whole craftsmanship piece, there's a whole uh, library of enterprise support and tools and unit testing libraries and mocking frameworks all around uh, giving you that ability to engineer instead of program. Um, we've got WPF and XAML rich clients and MVC for web portals we kind of talked about, uh, web API for our REST based uh, mobile applications and, and then WCF uh, web services for uh, a lot of our, our middleware and scalability type things and uh, .NET console apps we use for a lot of our just jobs that run periodically and uh, some services. Um, some other tech we use. Uh, we got the iOS. Uh, we do native Android and native iOS apps um, primarily because, again, we're looking for that, that experience for people. We're looking for uh, as native and good an experience as we can possibly provide. Um, so we actually have a combination of both um, you know, iOS developers and Android developers on our team that are working on building those out. Um, and then we, for our, our web technologies, we supplement a lot of the, the ASP MVC stuff with the modern uh, JavaScript bootstrap, React.js, AngularJS stuff, just to, again, provide a better experience to people. And those. So I guess the synopsis, besides thank you to you, are you skipping me? You don't even want me to say that one? All right. Become the jack of all trades, master of some. <laughs> Pick something to, to know implicitly just so that you can learn it well enough to know what to look for in other things. And uh, some of the, the things that, that Jordan's going to talk about right now uh, are how much like, team members matter at Title Source. Like, we're, we're, not, we're looking to pair you with the things that you're interested in that help the world <laughs> and help the projects that we're working on. Um, and uh, we're providing things like uh, Tesseract, which we, I think, I don't know if you've heard of QL bullet time. Uh, Tesseract is the, te the title source equivalent of we get half a day every um, Monday to work on pet projects, learn new languages, and apply like new technologies so that we can figure out. And we've actually had a lot of things that we've stumbled across that we've then taken and incorporated into our daily work, um, libraries and whatnot, from having that extra time to research. Um, and then uh, all of our team leaders are focused on like how do we get better, how do our team members get better, and we have growth plans for people to make sure that uh, they're constantly learning, getting better, learning from their mistakes, becoming an engineer, and, and beyond. So uh, I'll give it with that to uh, Jordan um, after questions. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? So I'm going to be talking a little bit about, uh, as Glenn said, what we kind of expect and in general kind of what the industry is coming to expect out of uh, software developers. So I'm Jordan Malakowski. I'm one of the team leaders. Um, I work with Glenn and with Azam on the Synapse team, which is focused on more documents-oriented uh, development. So kind of uh, to, to the question earlier about you know, what we do as team leaders, part of mine is uh, job is to set kind of the vision of what do we want our team in terms of documents to be doing and, and what uh, are we looking at in terms of team members, what's the good balance, how do we get the right people in to be doing the work that we're doing. So to start with, one of the things I want to talk about is mis myths and misconceptions, I've just kind of slapped them together, about what a developer is and what people are looking for in terms of companies for developers. So first one there, as, as Glenn kind of alluded to, is you know, a code monkey. You know, people just want somebody to come in who's like, hey, here's this project, you work on it, come back when it's done. And that's not really how developers work in uh, most corporations and especially in our business. Uh, second myth is the cubicle farm where everybody is just kind of in there, everybody gets their piece of the work and you know, you, somebody comes in and tells you, okay, you're working on this piece and you're working on this piece and you're working on that piece and, and when you get done, you're like, okay, I'm finished with this piece. Okay, let's plug that in and that's the one piece of the puzzle and you just keep building the puzzle and building the puzzle until it's done. Um, it's the whole waterfall strategy. It really doesn't work terribly well from uh, kind of a getting in there and getting the right kind of software in. Um, and it's not really how, again, how companies tend to work now. The third one is kind of the, taking the opposite approach. It's you have the one programmer who has the 
awesome work area. He can just come in and he can put everything together and just create this awesome thing all by himself just from his skills and his expertise and just his genius. And I, you know, I'll take it, there are a couple of people who are like that. I've heard stories about people, especially like in Google or Microsoft who are, you know, been there since the beginning who just can come in there and in one night slap out something that everybody's like, whoa, you did what? But uh, that's not really how most programmers work. Instead, how it works is you collaborate, you have teams, you, everybody works together. I don't know if everybody's heard this acronym for team, but together everyone achieves more. It's kind of cheeky, but it is true. It's the sum of the parts for a team are more than the whole. Um, you can get more done by relying on other people to help you. It's kind of that whole thing with specialization. I'm gonna do my part, somebody else is gonna do their part, and I'm gonna rely that they're gonna have my back in terms of getting the work done and, and proceeding. I can read the text in there if you want to, but it basically boils down to the reason why birds fly in a V is it's very hard to be in the front, but it's very easy to be in the side as you get the wind flow going across there. It's the same thing in like NASCAR when you have the uh, you know cars cruising behind other ones. Uh, and after a while, the lead bird gets tired and moves into the back and somebody else takes that position and the whole flock can move much farther than they would be if they were flying individually. And the same thing operates with teams with companies. So what does that mean for you as developers? It means that you can't just look at your skills, you also have to balance that out with your ability to work in a team. Uh, and they're not, one's better than another, it's not if you're great at working in a team but your skills are kind of lacking, that's really not gonna work either. You have to achieve that balance and find out, you know, how do I get good personal skills, how can I work well with others, and how can I also grow my own skills in terms of development and in terms of your other knowledge that you have. So, so it starts with you. Now, I don't know if anybody's uh, kind of heard of the be, no, do. This is actually the Army's big motto when they're teaching leaders on how to be leaders and about what it is to develop people. And the three aspects that form a person in their ability to work with others and to work in an organization are these three aspects, be, know, and do. So we're gonna start with no. No is the easiest one to change. It's like, hey, if you don't know something, I can give you a book, I can send you to a website, I can show you a video, uh, I can sit down with you and kind of go over it. And it's basically just imparting knowledge. Uh, a lot of this comes from a programmer's perspective is things like knowing C Sharp, knowing object-oriented programming, knowing your databases, how to use SQL, um, knowing things that are starting to get a little bit more nebulous, like you know the software development lifecycle, knowing design patterns, knowing the things that you need to do in order to get your work done, as well as communication, interpersonal skills, that side of knowing how do I relate to somebody. Um, a lot of times I'll get uh, people as team members who come in and they've got awesome tech skills, but uh, what I do as a team leader is help coach them through to say, hey, okay, you're, you're, you're doing great in learning this technology, you're going through and you know blazing a trail forward, but people hate you <laughs> because you're going through and telling them, no, that's stupid, uh, or no, that idea won't work. And that's not the way you want to kind of go about it. You want to talk to them and say, if you think their idea is stupid, first stop and just think and say, well, why do you think that is stupid? And then start going through the why. Say, well, did you think about this aspect? Did you think about how this is going to impact um, the speed of the system? Did you think about how um, you know, when you go in and do this thing, it's just going to be a nightmare for them to have to click five different times all in one page to do one thing. Um, and just walk them through your thought processes about why you think it's stupid. And then rather than say that, at the end of it, they'll go, oh, you know what, this probably wasn't the best of ideas. And then, you know, you've made your point, but it's in a nice way and in a way that they kind of come to it themselves. Um, and on the same hand, you can get somebody who's really good at working with people, but maybe they're kind of like a little bit green in terms of their technical knowledge. And then you kind of go to the knowledge part and say, hey, here you go, here's books, here's um, somebody who knows this area better than you, go and talk with them, They maybe set them up with a mentor to kind of go and help them out in those technical areas. So B, or no is the uh, kind of easiest one. Flipping on the other side, B is the hardest to change, because um, it is who you are as a person. Um, and I'm not gonna go over all of this in detail. Um, for those of you who know Myers-Briggs, the middle one is the personality um, exam and uh, 
categorization for Myers-Briggs. It kind of tells you in four different categories whether you're an introvert versus an extrovert, i.e. whether you uh, enjoy going out and interacting with people and that kind of gets your juices going or whether you like, you know, yeah, there's these people. Yeah, just tell me what I need to do. I'm going to go sit over here and just program by myself. I don't, I don't like being interrupted and, and having to you know, work with people necessarily. It does not mean you don't necessarily like people. It just means that you get more enthusiastic and you get more energy and you get more drive by being and working on things with yourself. Um, so we kind of go and look at and uh, you know who are the different personality types. Now rather than having 16 different things, it's you know ENFP and INTJ and trying to remember all these different things. At uh, Title Source, we boil it down to four different personality types. We say you're a builder, you're an adventurer, you're a planner, you're a relater. And I'm not going to go and describe each one of those because I want you to just think for a second. You know, just looking at the names of them, not even the images that I presented on here, you know, you can kind of get a picture of what kind of person that is. And, you know, think about the people you've worked with before and then try to think, you know, what kind of category are they? What kind of category do you think you are? Um, and we can kind of generalize kind of those personality types into four different sets. Now, it doesn't mean anybody is all one thing. Um, you know, there are people who are like adventure planners. There are people who are builder relators. Uh, and so there can be some combination in there, but it's understanding kind of who you are and how you fit into it. And then who you are also defines what kind of things you think are important. So what we're looking at in terms of programmers is we want people who take their personalities and then apply them in a way that they are self-driven, where they care about other people, um, it kind of relates to being a team player, um, and they're obsessed with knowing. And a lot of this is what are you focused on? What do you value? So that's part of the B as well. It's not just your personality types, it's also what you value. And those things combined form who you are and the B. And if you think about it, you know, how many times have you in your lifetime changed the things that you, you know, truly value? You know, if you value family, does that really change after 10, 20, 30 years? Mm, sometimes, but over a 30 year period, you might see some change over a one month period. Not so much, you know, especially compared to the no. Last is the do. So you can know a lot of stuff and you can be a great person and if you sit home and watch TV, yeah, it's still not very good for you. You're not gonna be successful. You're not gonna be somebody that we're gonna kind of be looking for both from a company standpoint as well as the industry. You know, we want somebody who's going to go out and do, who's going to be driving um, in, and initiating on things. And we want somebody who is gonna say, hey, I just learned this thing. Hey, I should go share it with my team and tell them all about it. And oh, they think this is wonderful too and this is great. I should go tell the other teams about it. And oh yeah, you know, in our uh, situation, Shadow Source is part of a family of companies. We should go outside of our own company and go talk to our sister companies and tell them what's going on and, and really is sharing that knowledge because if you are succeeding, great. If you're, if you're you know, this high off the ground and everybody else is down here, it's kind of great you know, feeling to be that high. But if you're not sharing that, then that's what you're going to get is this. Instead, if you share your knowledge, you may get like this. You're, you're boosting not just other people up, but by boosting them up, they are your team members and they will support you too. If they find out something really awesome and they come share it with you because you shared something with them, you're going to grow as well. Um, and then last one, go back. <laughs> last one is leading others and being consistent. Um, I guess two different things. The first one, you can kind of see on the left, the guy who said, hey, I reached the top, but I'm gonna help you reach there as well. And it's somebody who's gonna forge the path forward. It kind of relates to that sharing knowledge and say, hey, I'm gonna go try this thing and I want you to come with me. Isn't this awesome and exciting? We want people who are going to incentivize not just themselves, but their entire team to say, hey, I have a vision for this. I have an idea and let's get behind all of this and, and forge it together and find um, that success together. And the last is just being consistent. And you know, it's great if you achieve success, if you put out this awesome project that was wonderful, if you then sit there and go, yeah, I'm great, and then don't really do anything else for the rest of your you know, tenure at a company, like in the that rest of that year, the next three years. Yeah, you had that success, but really is it that wonderful? No, it's the person who is constantly striving to say, hey, I just had a success. How can I match that? How can I exceed that? How can I push myself and uh, the company and my team to get better and better and trying to continually try to strive to raise that bar up. So the last one on this one is, uh, so I'm switching, sorry, switching course to company culture. Um, you know, you guys know kind of who you are. 
but how does that fit in with the different companies that are out there? This is something that I feel that a lot of times people who are looking at the job market really don't get when they're looking for a position is that it's not just the company saying, hey, we want you. It should also be, do you want that company? Uh, so I've got two kind of examples over here of kind of a, if you will, Google on the left and maybe an IBM on the right. Um, you know, Google's known for its company culture of having bright colors, of having kind of a casual atmosphere, of having a big collaboration and open environment. There's a lot of conversation and things going by. IBM is more known for kind of that structure of having, okay, everybody is going to have their space in there and you're going to have your big projects that you're working on and we're going to you know, pull ahead and pull together still, but we're going to be driving in a lot more of a kind of a structured environment. Now, a lot of times and, uh, people will look at it and say, well, you know, I want to work for Google because that's more awesome, that's more flexible, that's more exciting, but that's not the right thing for everybody. There are people who like structure, who thrive in an environment where they know the rules, where things are laid out for them and they can kind of plan ahead and they can uh, kind of have that vision of here's where my place is and I know what I'm supposed to be doing. And that sense of structure, this is actually a better environment on the right. You know, going with more of a kind of that large corporation is a better choice for them. So one of the things you need to look at when you are looking at opportunities is not just is the, am I a good fit for the company I'm looking at, but is this company actually a good fit for me? Because uh, you, know, you can be working on awesome projects and hate going to work every day because of the people, because of the environment that you're in. And conversely, you can enjoy going to work and really not be accomplishing much, not really growing and things like that. You really want to maintain, again, that balance between being happy at work and really thriving and growing as, in work as well. So this is a little bit of a snapshot of title source. If you uh, go out onto our website, you should be able to see the video that uh, I took this from. But uh, this is kind of a, a team area environment. And you'll see here that we're a little bit more kind of like that at Google side. Um, things are a little bit more casual. So these are members of a team who are all getting together and, uh, and celebrating a success. And you'll see you know, everybody's in, um, you might be able to take it, tell from there, but they're in jeans basically and just kind of casual clothing. And you see the lady here with a skull on her uh, t-shirt there. Um, and you can see in the background the two big heads that are back there. Um, those we call big heads. Uh, Fathead is one of our family of companies and we don't have name plates, we have big heads. So when you come and to join Title Source or one of our family companies, there'll be a session where you'll go in and they'll take your picture and then a couple of weeks later they will call you up and say, hey, come pick up your big head and you put that up. Um, so it, it's very much more of kind of a relaxed environment um, we are, as we put it, it's a little colloquial at this point, but it's kind of, you know, the play hard, work hard strategy. It's, you know, we we're going to try to make our environment as comfortable and as fun for you as we can, but we do expect a lot out of the people who come. Uh, we have different levels that we go in and look at with people in terms of achievement um, when we come to our, you know, end of year reviews. And one of them is meets expectations, and then the next one is exceeds expectations. And that's pretty much it. Um, and it, I meet expectations, you'll see right on the line of the, the description of it is above average skills and knowledge for experience. So we're not just expecting you to come in with average skills. We're expecting that you are going to be kind of going back to that be no do. We're going to be somebody who's going to be self-driven. You're going to be somebody who has wanted to learn and has really strove to grow themselves and to be a better person and we want to help provide an environment that is going to allow you to continue in that kind of a vein. So continuing with kind of the culture theme, um, being part of the Quicken Loans family of companies, we as a whole, every single one of us, uh, all the companies who are in um, that FOC, have and follow what we call the isms. Um, so you can see the definition of there, the ideals we live by at, it says Quicken Loans, but it's also, you know, every one of our family of companies and have a lot more to do with who we are than what we do. Um, so this is, again, defining our culture. So if you go out and talk to a couple of different companies out there, you go look out there and you're like, okay, what kind of a company are you? And they don't have things kind of laid out for you. If you go to the URL there, and if you guys want it, we can kind of point it out later, but you can just find it by going to the Quicken Loan site as well. Um, we will list out every single one of the 19 isms that we have and exactly what they are and, and what we are looking for in them. 
And this is not just a kind of a lip service. This is not a, oh, the leadership kind of says, hey, this is what you should do. These are things that are pushed and they're believed been by our team members. So if somebody is like, oh, I'm going to go and, uh, oh, I've just spilled coffee all over the floor. Oh, I'm just going to leave it there. Somebody else will clean it up. You'll have people go, no, 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 you should clean that up. That's, that's not doing the right thing, um, which is this one here. So I put up just a couple of samples. We have we are the they. We have... Um, it's not what is or who is right, it is what is right, um, which comes back to if somebody has an idea and they're the CEO of the company, you know, Jeff Eisenstadt in our case, um, if they say, hey, we should do this just because they're the CEO does not mean that that's what we should be doing. Is, is that idea valid? Is that, does that idea make sense? And everybody, every single team member on our team has the not just the right but the obligation to kind of step up and say, I don't think that's the right thing, and to explain why that is. And if they're correct, if their arguments are correct, then they will be backed by everybody else, including the CEO who maybe pitched that idea out. They say, oh, you know what? That's right. Um, so we're going to follow that because that is the best approach. We have uh, yes before no um, is the one sign with the lady with the yes. And that is, don't, if somebody comes up to you, don't just be like, oh, no, we're not going to do that. Always at least give them a chance. Listen to their arguments. Uh, come up and ask questions. It doesn't mean in the end you might not say no, but at least say, yes, I'm interested in hearing this idea. Tell me about it. Show that level of respect to them that they have important ideas. It's not just you know, that you know everything. Other people have uh, ideas and they are valid. Even if the last 15 times they've come to you and said, oh, I've had this idea, and you're like, okay, let me hear it. And you're like, no, this doesn't work out. That 16th idea might be one that makes the company a million dollars. So you can't just throw the baby out with the bath wash, if you will. You need to pay attention to and show respect to all the team members. And the last one over there is raising your level of awareness. Um, I just kind of threw out a bunch of them. If you're really interested, I re highly recommend going out to the site, look at all 19 of them. Um, they will really give you a good view of who we are as a company. Sure. So we have three different seasons for interns. Um, the summer one is which is of which is our biggest one. Uh, we're now, I believe, we are still opening up and having positions for interns across the board, including software developers. Uh, if you're interested, I highly recommend you uh, apply. But the internship program is, in general, a three-month program. It's flexible. There's not um, rigid limits on that. Uh, we have summer, we have a winter, and we have a fall. Um, so it basically kind of spaced out throughout the year. And the internship program is a paid internship program. Um, and when you start in, you are assigned to a team just like somebody who is a full team member. We're not going to give you scut work. It's not, oh, go and create this logo. You are actually given an actual project, usually either as part of um, the team that, they're, that you're working with or sometimes that you are actually heading. And these are things that like, oh, we didn't have time for this, but hey, you're here. We're going to trust that you are capable of going through and doing this project. Um, and we are going to provide you with the resources, we're going to provide you mentors, everything in that regard to achieve that. Um, so you, you go through and you do that. At the end of it, you go through and do an internship presentation. Um, if you are uh, looking for full-time work, we'll go through and do interviews face-to-face with, -face with people in there to see if we want to bring you on full-time. Um, or if you are still going through and getting your degree and still want to stay in school, you can go through the summer. Um, do an internship, and when you come back around next year, um, you can apply again and just continue to do that. But it's a great uh, chance to work, and it is full-time, so you come in basically full-time and do a job working with us, uh, just like a, a, any other software developer or uh, business analyst or anybody else uh, who is part of that team. Hi, I'm Brian, and uh, the last part of this presentation is an introduction to machine learning. Uh, and I usually get through this in about 15 minutes, so I think we'll be done around 7 o'clock and then we'll have questions at the end. So one of the, we recently did uh, our goals for the year. Uh, I'll, in a second, I'll go to the next slide. We did goals for the year, and one of our goals at Tidalsource was to have uh, our decisions be driven by data. So we want to make data-driven decisions. And uh, one, one of the ways we do that is by using computers to learn from data. So actually, machine learning is something that I've been studying for a couple of years now. And uh, I've, I work in the data science program, uh, program, excuse me, that is the data science team. And we do this. We do machine learning. We do statistics. We learn from the data that we gather to improve our processes in the, in the business. So just by a show of hands, how many people have heard of the term data science here? All right. And machine learning is not usually something you hear. So who, who has heard of that? 
Oh, okay, good. So, for example, recently we had uh, Google who owns a company called DeepMind, and they built a program very recently that beat the world's top player of Go at Go. And that program learned from 30 million moves in the, uh, from, from, from Go Masters. And they did it probably in a couple of days. So instead of having a, a master of Go be trained over decades, a deep learning program that coded by a couple of people actually learned to play Go better than any human in a couple of days. So this is what machine learning does. We're enabling computers to learn, and they're able to do it faster than us. And we can make our uh, business process faster. We can learn more. We can have smarter business by doing this. OK, so this is an introduction. Uh, I'll have a question at the end, but don't worry. Just raise your hand if you, if you don't understand something. And this is going to be a little bit more uh, technically involved. Hopefully, it won't be too involved. So uh, we want to create algorithms that learn from data automatically. That's what machine learning is. We want to, uh, want to either optimize or uh, by using example data or past experience. And it's called building a model, a model of something. So we want to have predictions and decisions coming out of that model. So we call it a data model, the, the things that we build. So if you think of any, for example, uh, an equation that describes gravity, that's actually a model of gravity. So what Newton actually discovered was not gravity. He discovered a model of gravity. He was able to describe the interaction of really small objects, the interaction of planets using one model. So that's what we want to do. And we, want to, we are able to make predictions using that. Next one. All right, so normally, for example, when you're using Microsoft Word, are you expecting to the, the program to behave differently when you do a right click or when you do anything? You're expecting the same thing to happen every time. The program's behavior does not change. But we are able to have a program change its behavior by using machine learning. And that's kind of hard to do. And we're going to keep talking about it. So when is it useful to do machine learning? When we have humans that are able to do it. So for example, robots on Mars are probably learning a little bit to be able to do it there, because no humans have ever been there. We are, can't explain the expertise. So for example, vision algorithms, you can't really explain how you see things, but computers are able to figure it out. So, uh, and also speech recognition, we probably use a lot of machine learning. The solution is changing really fast. Uh, running a computer network, you can use machine learning on that. Um, when you need to adapt a solution, for example, biometrics, or the last one, the really interesting one, is when humans can't learn fast enough, then we can use machines or computers to do the learning, and they're able to do it fast enough. And there's times when you don't really want to use it. So for example, when you don't want Microsoft Word to change its behavior, you really don't want to use machine learning in, in Microsoft Word. So when the domain is well known, you don't want to use machine learning. When the rules don't change very often, it's not necessary. And there, you don't really need to learn how to calculate payroll. The rules are well known even though you could actually derive a program to calculate payroll if you really wanted to. I'll just go to the end. All right, so we, uh, that's OK. We can just skip a slide, make it a little faster. <laughs> I, I put a lot of information in here. So, so for example, no, 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 I think that's good enough right here. <laughs> All right, so supervised learning. Supervised learning, there's also unsupervised learning, but a nice example to get started with is unsuper uh, supervised learning. And that means that it's easy to visualize. So for example, we want to learn a rule to predict the output of future inputs. And the rule is easy to understand. So knowledge extraction is done uh, to uh, extract knowledge out of data sets. When you do compression, OK, actually, let's go to the, the, the next slide. So this is classification. We have a rule, and we have a bunch of data points. Every one of these is a credit, uh, is a credit, uh, is a person with a credit score. So for example, we want to tell if a human has high risk of default or low risk default. So if they have a high income and they have high savings, then they have low risk of default. And if you have low income and low savings, or low savings, and yeah, and if anything else, we really we think they have low, uh, we, we, they have a low credit score. So we actually just developed a rule, and I think it's the next one. If uh, income is more than alpha uh, one and savings is more than alpha two, then low risk, else high risk. So the area up there was classified by a computer, and we just developed a rule. 
And we can actually do that. Actually, companies do this all the time to develop these models, but they do it automatically. And the good thing is, is they can do it with much, much more data, millions of data points. They can learn from it. OK, and well, that's it. So here is an example of something called a support vector machine. And the name's a little convoluted, but it's very easy to understand if you do it in two dimensions. So we have, just like the credit score, two dimensions. And then you just imagine whatever you want, x2 and x1, two things that are measured, two dimensions, anything at all, really. And we have a set of points, one red and one blue. And we can see uh, that the blue points are on the left side, red points are on the, on the right side. But we want our computer to learn to differentiate between the two sets. And it turns out we are actually building a linear separator here. And um, I think the next one is, yeah. So how do you do that? How do you get a computer to learn to separate these two sets of points? We actually, are, we actually have many possible lines. Actually, we can make any line. There's, all, all, there's actually one best line, and we can see it right here. The B makes the most sense, right? So can anybody here tell me why B makes the most sense? Least extreme. All right, so you can see it. And you have actually really, really cool visual cortex right here in the back of your brain that's telling you something that the computer is not able to see, all right? So there is something called a margin between this point and the line, and a margin between this point and the line. And B has the largest margin, all right, between here and here. So that's why it is the best line. But you saw that because you did a whole bunch of processing in your, in, with your visual cortex. So we want a computer to do the exact same thing. Right? So the margin is there. It's the line that maximizes the margin is the best line. So how do you find that? Oh, OK. This is called maximum mar margin learning. I put a couple other terms in there. So uh, you know what? It's the next one, I think. Uh, you know, I wanted the one that said uh, optimization, but I think I'll just uh, talk. So this is actually an optimization <laughs> problem. We shouldn't have uh, made a complicated presentation. But yeah, it's right, an optimization problem. And actually, very, well, it's very easily stated. And there's a, couple, a lot of different things you can do with it. Actually, that toy data set was easy to, easy to visualize. And it was easy to solve. But there's a lot of data sets that are not so nicely divided. So there's also a lot of, a lot of techniques you have to learn. It's called uh, linear sample of data sets. And you can just see that. But that was a nice example to learn from. But why do we want to do this with computers instead of with our big brains? It's because that was two dimensions. What if you have 1,000 dimensions? What if you have 100,000 dimensions, which is actually a real thing? You usually get that in biometric data uh, or bioengineering data. Uh, computers can actually deal with that. And the, the thing is, we can actually visualize ourselves two dimensions easily. We can do three dimensions. But have you ever tried to visualize a four-dimensional data set? A computer has no problems with it. And computers can do something like that in milliseconds, right? So this is how we take data. And we use an optimization algorithm. And we maximize the performance of something. And we are able to classify something automatically. All right, so I think that's the end of my presentation. I apologize. It was a lot of terms that I didn't need to be in there. And uh, are there any questions?